Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit and instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoys consolations. Through Christ our Lord, amen. St. Justin, pray for us. St. Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So as we uh, come to the last of our class, we are going to talk about the martyrdom of St. Paul. And this is a painting of, um, of that. Let me see if I could well, maybe you could see a little bit better. Um, it's by Simon de Bowes, okay, de Bowes, the beheading of St. Paul, okay. So, um, today we're going to talk about this particular article and others, um, because as you can remember, there's not much detail about what happens to Paul after he arrives in Rome. Um, St. Luke is, is silent upon it. Um, so we're gonna talk about a little bit of that. So this article is called The Death of the Apostle Paul, uh, written by Richard Good. Uh, and I found it on BibleResearchToday.com. Okay, The Death of the Apostle Paul. Um, okay, so here it goes. How and where and when did the Apostle Paul die? And scripturally, uh, we're not really sure, okay? But that's scripture uh, speaking, okay? We're getting out of focus. Out of focus for some reason. We're back in focus. Maybe it's because the light. Let me try again. Okay, so once again, we're not really sure about what happened to Paul because in the scripture is silent. There's no written record in the scripture regarding his death. Um, the only place where Paul actually writes about his death, or not really about his death, but his openness and preparedness for martyrdom is for example in Philippians chapter 1 21 to 24 where he says for to me living is Christ and dying is gain if I am to live in the flesh that means the fruitful labor for me and I do not know which I prefer I am hard pressed between the two my desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you so basically, Paul is saying, look, you know, my heart is half and half, you know, for, for me, it's better for me to die and go and be with Jesus. But for you, I know you need me. So it's better for me to be here on earth with you. So he's basically saying he's kind of divided. Sadly, he's kind of similar. I'm divided. In one sense, I have to be obedient to my bishop and go where he sends me. But at the same time, I want to stay. I don't want to go because I like you guys so much. But I have to be obedient to the Lord. Okay. So, and in 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, he says, As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So it almost sounds like he's ready to go. Like, you know, I've done what I can. I've done the best and I have no regrets. I have kept the faith, you know? So Paul does mention a little bit of this kind of attitude that he's ready to go. Anytime God calls him, he's ready to go. And also it's not just because he was going to Rome, but I think, you know, as we have seen, like he, he survived many shipwrecks and persecutions. He was almost like one stoned to death. And like he, he almost, you know, died many times. So it's not like 
this was new, but I think, yeah, he had this kind of attitude that he's always ready to go if the Lord calls him. So does it mean that we have no information at all? No, we do have uh, some information, traditions around Paul's uh, death. So we are dependent on accounts and traditions recorded by later Christian writers. Now, later Christian writers does not mean like later, like really late, but later than the scriptures. But for us, it's really earlier times. And it's funny that all of them, all of them agree that Paul was a martyr. There's no doubt about that. And nobody says, no, Paul actually had a wonderful life on this, you know, place with, you know, a beautiful house with wife and children. No, there's nothing. Like, of course, all written records point to the fact that he was a martyr and quite possibly during the Neronian persecution, persecution done by the Emperor Nero, okay, that followed the great fire of Rome, okay? For example, Clement, you know, who wrote this around 96, 97 AD, he says, owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both in the East and West, he gained a illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world and come to the extreme limit of the West and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. So this is the first letter of Clement, chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Okay. Another writing, Acts of Paul. Now, this is not in the scripture, okay? So it's a Apocryphal, basically meaning we don't know who is a true author. It says act of Paul, but it was not written by Paul. And we believe that it's from the second century. So this is not scripture, but it does kind of give us a little bit of background understanding. It's not like guaranteed that it's all true, but uh, it kind of gives us some sense of idea what was the knowledge at that time. And here it says, then Paul stood with his face to the east and lifted up his hands unto heaven and prayed a long time. And in his prayer, he conversed in Hebrew tongue with the fathers and then stretched forth his neck without speaking. And then the executioner or speculator struck off his head, milk spurted upon the cloak of the soldier and the soldier and all that were there present when they saw it marveled and glorified God which had given such a glory unto Paul, and they went and told Caesar what was done. Okay, this is from the Acts of Paul. Another writing by Clement of Alexandria. His, he was born in 150 and died at 215 AD. For the teaching of our Lord Jesus at his advent, beginning with Augustus and Tiberius, was completed in the middle of the times of Tiberius, and that of the apostles embracing the ministry of Paul ends with Nero, okay? Also, Tertullian, who was born 155 to, uh, and he died in 220 AD, he writes that Peter is struck, that Stephen is overwhelmed by stones. Acts 7.59, that James is slain as is a victim at the altar, that Paul is beheaded has been written in their own blood. And if a heretic wishes his confidence to rest upon a public record, the archives of the empire will speak as would the stones of Jerusalem. We read the lives of the Caesars. At Rome, Nero was the first who stained with blood the rising faith. Then is Peter girt by another, John 21, 18, when he is made fast to the cross. Then does Paul obtain a birth suited to Roman citizenship when in Rome, he springs to life again, ennobled by martyrdom, okay? So there are various early Christian writers who do proclaim and write that Paul was martyred in Rome, okay? However, there's still kind of a little bit of 
question and puzzles that is, remains because there's a question about Spain. Now, I think this is the first time I brought it up, but see, there are some writings that suggest that Paul, St. Paul left for Spain from Rome. For example, in Romans 15, 23 to 24 and 28, we read, but now with no further place for me in these regions, I desire as I have for many years to come to you when I go to Spain. And he says, so when I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will set out by way of you to Spain. So even in Romans, the letter to the Romans, Paul does speak explicitly that, that he wants to go to Spain. Now, they didn't go or not, we're not sure, but at least here we know that he desired so. Then we have another writing, the early you know, century, which is called the Muratorian Canon, which is the oldest known list of the New Testament. And it was written in the second century. And in there we find this verse. It goes, the journey of Paul who from the city, Rome, proceeded to Spain. So there is kind of a little bit of, you know, maybe indication that maybe he did end up in Spain, okay? Also, Hippolytus of Rome, who was born in 170 AD, died in 235 AD, says, and Paul entered into the apostleship a year after the assumption of Christ and beginning at Jerusalem, he advanced as far as Illyricum and Italy and Spain, preaching the gospel for five and 30 years. And in the time of Nero, he was beheaded at Rome and was buried there. Even St. John Chrysostom, who was born in 374 to 407 AD. So like, this is a little bit later, but he says, two years then, Paul passed bound in Rome. Then he was set free. Then having gone into Spain, he saw Jews also in like manner. And then he returned to Rome where he was slain by Rome. Okay, so maybe, you know, after the Acts of the Apostles, when we saw that Rome was in, I mean, that Paul was in Rome for two years, then, you know, they couldn't find any charge against them, so they let him free. So maybe he did go to Spain, and then he returned to Rome, where he is martyred. Okay, but these are some of the things that we find in early writings. Now, um, how do we know for sure? Well, I guess maybe we can at this time. There's no real clear record of anything, but uh, it's just a... Uh, you know, something to think about. Does it change anything that much? Probably not, but this is just nice to know in the background, right? Now, the next question is, then why is Luke silent? Like, why did he stop writing after the Acts of the Apostles? Like, why did he write anything more? Well, there are a number of possible reasons that people came up with over the years. First, Luke was simply unaware of Paul's death or that he was still alive at the time of writing. Okay, so when he wrote the Acts of the Apostles, Paul was still alive, or maybe Luke had to go somewhere else, okay? And it's not like we have like social media now, people can text each other or, you know, put on the Facebook, you know? Like it, it took time for news to travel to, you know, different locations, right? Second, Luke was embarrassed by the lack of support of to Paul in Rome by his fellow Christians. This might be hinted at first Clement the letter, first letter of Clement 5, 5, 7, and 2 Timothy 4, 16, which is a possibility, but we were not too sure. Third possibility, Luke could all have assumed that his readers were already aware of Paul's death and including it would have unnecessarily deflected attention away from his main theological aim, which is to show how gospel message was conveyed from Jerusalem to the Rome and the ends of the earth, okay? So it wasn't really necessary, okay? It wasn't really part of the, you know, original intention of writing the Acts of the Apostles. Fourth, the death of two key figures, Jesus and Paul, three, including Peter, at the hand of the Roman authorities created significant problems for the early church Drawing attention to Paul's death could have been not only embarrassing, but seriously undermined Luke's pro-Roman apologetics. So basically saying that, see, they're saying that there's a, there's kind of a little bit of um, 
evidence that Luke was very familiar with the Roman church and the Roman Christians in Rome. And, uh, you know, like kind of highlighting the fact that, you know, Romans killed Jesus, Paul, and Peter could kind of create some sort of image problem for the Christians in Rome. So Luke was kind of defending them. Possible, but, but I don't know. I, I kind of think this is way off. But anyway, fifth reason that people have maybe attributed to the reason is that the parallels that Luke draw between the ministry of Jesus and that of Paul and Peter meant that he needed to be cautious lest the leaders drew parallels between their deaths, kind of tied to the fourth reason. Sixth reason, Luke planned the third volume, which would begin with Paul's death as Acts began with Jesus' ascension. Possible, but we will never know. Luke 7, Luke used the abrupt ending of Mark's gospel as a literary model for Acts. Possible. Um, the reason why they say that is because actually, you know, scholars believe that at the end of gospel of Mark, actually, originally it ended you know, before Jesus' crucifixion or Jesus' death, or at Jesus' death, I should say, and then there was nothing about the resurrection, and then later on, another author came and wrote it and added it in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, you know, in honesty, you know, all these scholars can argue whatever they want for us. It doesn't really matter because um, it's not like just because some of these writers didn't write it in the first time doesn't mean that Jesus was not resurrected, right? So it, it really doesn't make any difference, okay? But anyway, scholars are talking about stuff like this. Um, what do I think? I personally just don't think uh, there's any real clear reason. Maybe, maybe you know, um, it just wasn't reason. It wasn't really um, that easy for example I'll, I'll give you my actually i will give you my opinion at the end of the at the end of the class okay what i think because it's kind of all ties in okay let's just move on from now i'll talk about what i think is happening okay all right so that's the end of that article now so we have to look at other sources to figure out so what kind of happened so for example, for example, I'm going to use the Wikipedia, okay? Sometimes it's nice to find all these different sources from the internet. Um, be cautious, like Wikipedia does not mean that everything is 100% verified or correct, but it's kind of nice to have a basic understanding and knowledge, okay? So we could just kind of take a look at it, okay? So when you look up at, look up at St. Paul, the apostle from Wikipedia, it says that, you know, the date of his martyrdom is probably occurred after the great fire of Rome in July 64, but before the last year of Nero Zain, which was in 68. So between 64 and 68. And the one who said that is Raymond Brown, a Catholic uh, scripture theologian. And in his book that was written in 1997, page 436. So Raymond Brown, thinks that it's probably after July 64, but before 68, okay? Now, does it mean that really that Paul was martyred? Well, once again, there are some people who say, yes, it is martyrdom. For example, Clement in his first letter written in 95 and 96 AD, St. Ignatius, okay? wrote in 110 AD that that's the case. Dionysius of Corinth, around 166 to 174 AD, wrote that Paul was martyred. There were also others who actually wrote that Paul was martyred, but also by decapitation, okay? By beheading, okay? Cutting his head off, right? At Rome by Nero, and that's Acts of the Apostles, written in 160 AD, Tertullian, 200 AD, Eusebius of Caesarea, 320 AD, Lactantius, um, 318 AD, that's not 3189 AD, sorry, so it's 318 to 319 AD, Jerome, 392 AD, John Chrysostom, around 349 to 407, that's his birth, his life, and this person named Sulpicius Severus, he wrote it in 4.3 AD. All of them wrote that 
Paul was martyred in Rome by Nero by decap decapitation. Where was it? Uh, where was it? Um, you know, that took place in Rome. Well, the legend, a tradition, legend. You know, says that it's on Aqua Salvia, on the Via Laurentina. Okay, that's the location where he died. Okay, so after Paul was decapitated, his severed head rebounded three times, boing, 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 giving rise to a source of water each time it touched the ground, which is how the place earned the name San Paolo a Lettere Fontane, okay? St. Paul at the Three Fountains, okay? What about his remains? Well, also legend or tradition, in the church, you know, passed down by word of mouth, okay? Paul's body was buried outside the walls of Rome at the second mile on the Via Ostiensis on the estate owned by a Christian woman named Lucina or Lucina. In the fourth century, Emperor Constantine the Great built the first church. In between fourth and fifth centuries, it was considerably enlarged by the emperors Valentian I, Valentinian II, Theodosius I, then Arcadius, okay? The present day Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls was built there in the early 19th century, okay? Caius, in his writing Disputation Against Proclus in 198 AD, he wrote, I can point out the trophies of the apostles, for if you are willing to go to the Vatican or to the Ostian Way, you will find the trophies of those who founded this church. And this was written in the book of uh, Eusebius. Eusebius is a, a church historian. Now, um, Vatican, why Vatican? Well, Vatican is actually a hill, okay? Also outside of Rome, and that's where Peter was martyred and buried, okay? St. Peter. So he's saying, if you go to Vatican or the Ostinian way, you'll find the two apostles, remains of two apostles, St. Peter, and St. Paul. St. Jerome, in his writing, De Viris Illustribus, 392 AD, he writes, Paul was buried in the Ostinian way at Rome. Okay. Now in 2002, an eight foot long marble sarcophagus was discovered and he had an inscription, Paolo Apostolo Mart, which means Paul, apostle and martyr. And the Vatican archaeologists declared this to be the tomb of Paul the Apostle in 2005. Okay, so this is at, um, you know, St. Paul outside the walls, okay? And in June 2009, Pope Benedict XVI, now Pope Emeritus, announced the results of the excavation. And he said the sarcophagus was not open, but it was examined by means of a probe. Okay, why didn't he open it? Because when you once open the sarcophagus, then air gets in and then it ruins, decomposes the remains. So now they're using a different uh, method where they drill a small hole and put a big camera probe and they, they investigate. And they, in, inside the sarcophagus, they found pieces of incense, purple and blue linen and a small bone bone fragments, okay? And when this bone was radio um, carbon dated, it was to the first or second century and Vatican concluded that these findings support the conclusion that the tomb is Paul's. Um, so they're saying that it is very strongly um, possible that it is, you know, St. Paul's tomb but I don't think we could ever for sure say that it is, right? But we, there is very, very good evidence that strongly suggests that it's St. Paul's, okay? Why is it so hard to just say it? Because once again, in the ancient times, they didn't record things that we, the, the, the way we did, you know what I mean? We, it's just, it's just not the way it was done like today, right? So it, sometimes it's just, it's just hard to, 
is have 100% clarity or certainty, okay? But uh, very, very uh, close. What about the church's tradition? You know, like what does the church teach us? You know, besides all these biblical scholars and I call archeologists and all these people with different ideas, okay? Because sometimes these scholars and archeologists are necessarily Christians or even uh, Catholics. So they sometimes argue against, you know, the church's tradition or teaching. So what does the church say? Well, first of all, when we look at the Catholic encyclopedia, Basically, it says that ancient tradition makes it possible to establish following points. First, Paul suffered martyrdom near Rome at a place called Aquae Salve, now Tre Fontane, somewhat east of the Ostian Way, about two miles from the splendid Basilica of San Paolo Fuori le Mura, which marks his burial place. So that's Basilica of St. Paul's side of the wall. The martyrdom took place towards the end of the reign of Nero in the 12th year, according to St. Epiphanius, the 13th by Euthelius or the 14th syndrome. So that's 12th, 13th or 14th year of Nero's reign, okay? So even these saints kind of disagree upon the exact year. So this is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. What does Wikipedia say? It says that in the first Clement letter, you know, letter written by the Roman bishop Clement of Rome around the year nine reports this about Paul by reasons of jealousy, strife, by example, point out pride of patient endurance that he has been seven times. So we, we read that already in the beginning. Basically, yeah, he was martyred. Okay. Raymond Brown, also a Catholic theologian that we talked about, also commented, while it does, explicit, does not explicitly say that Paul was martyred in Rome, such a martyrdom in the most reasonable interpretation. So what Raymond Brown is saying that if you look in the letter of Clement, it does not say that he was martyred in Rome, but he was a martyr for sure. Okay? Eusebius of Caesarea, who wrote in fourth century states, Paul was beheaded in the reign of the Roman emperor Nero. This event has been dated either to the year 64 when Rome was de de devastated by uh, fire or a few years later to 67, okay. According to one tradition, the church of San Paolo alle tre fontane marks the place of Paul's execution. A Roman Catholic liturgical solemnity of Peter and Paul celebrate on June 29th, commemorates his martyrdom and reflects the tradition preserved by Eusebius that Peter and Paul were martyred at the same time. The Roman liturgical calendar for the following day now remembers all Christians martyred in these early persecutions. Formerly June 30th was the feast day of, for St. Paul. Persons or religious orders with special affinity for St. Paul can still celebrate their patron on June 30th. So basically, Peter's feast day is June 29th because that's the date of his martyrdom. They originally celebrated Paul's feast day on June 30th, but because there's some historical evidence or writings that say that they were martyred at the same time or similar time, we moved the you know, feast of St. Paul to June 29th and celebrate you know, the feast of St. Peter's and St. Paul together because also they were both in Rome and they're both the two pillars and foundations of our Catholic church. So that's why we were doing that, okay? However, uh, so there are some people who are religious orders who are, um, you know, affiliated with St. Paul, like the Paulines, that they still celebrate on June 30th because that was a traditional date, okay? The apocryphal acts of Paul and the apocryphal acts of Peter suggest that Paul survived Rome and traveled further west. Some think that Paul could have been revisited Greece and Asia Minor after his trip to Spain and might then have been arrested in Troas and taken to Rome and executed. Tradition holds that Paul was interred with St. Peter at Catacombas by the Via Appia until moved to what is now the Basilica of St. Paul's side of the walls of Rome. St. Bede in his Ecclesiastical History writes that Pope Vitalian in 665 gave Paul's relics, including a cross made from his prison chains, from the crypts of Lucina to King Oswy of Northumbria, Northern Britain. And that's why Paul is considered the patron saint of London. Okay, so these are some of the traditions that we have about St. Paul, about his remains. So. So there are various kind of legends and traditions and stories, but I think it all kind of boils down to the, yes, he was martyred in Rome, possibly by beheading, 
possibly by Nero, okay? And that was also when St. Peter was martyred, so probably happened very similarly, okay? Here's a picture of the San Paolo alle Tre Fontane, the three fountains, okay? The outside, here's the inside, okay? Um, it's hard to see, but maybe you could Google it, but I've been here, it's a beautiful church. Now, this is the Basilica of St. Paul's side of the walls, where now currently his relics remain. Okay, beautiful church. This is a statue of St. Paul, the outside of the church. Okay. So I think we should talk a little bit about the great fire of Rome because it kind of all starts from here. Uh, I'm gonna kind of look at the historical background of what happened, right? So this great fire of Rome in Latin is Incendio Magnum Rome, okay? It was an urban fire that occurred in July 64 AD. The fire began in the merchant's shops around Rome's chariot stadium, Circus Maximus, on the night of 19th of July. And the fire burned for like six days, okay? So after six days, the fire was brought under control, but before the damage could be assessed, the fire reignited and burned for another three days. So total of nine days. Wow, burning for nine days. So in the aftermath of the fire, two thirds of Rome had been destroyed. Two thirds, amazing. This was like, I mean, Rome had other fires historically, but this is the great fire of Rome because two thirds of the city completely destroyed by fire. Devastating, okay? According to Roman historian Tacitus and later Christian tradition, Nero blamed on the Christian community, initiated the first persecution against the Christian. So this is the beginning of the first Roman persecution, you know, of Christians. I mean, there were, you know, persecutions of Christians in Judea and Israel, right, in the early times, but this was like first Roman empires, emperors persecution, okay? This is where it began. And from then on, Christianity becomes outlawed, it becomes criminal to become a Christian, and they're persecuted until when Constantine the Great becomes the emperor and stops persecution of Christians. Uh, a lot of people say that it was Constantine the Great who made Christianity an official religion of the Roman Empire. That is uh, not true. That's not true. Uh, he just basically stopped persecution and allowed Christians as one of the many religions of Rome. It was a later date that you know another emperor i can't remember the exact name but that is he who makes christianity the official um religion of rome the roman empire okay so it's not the constantine the great just speaking about Constantine the great the reason why he did it because he had a dream remember he had a dream when he was at, a, at his final battle he dreamed of this shield with a cross Okay, and saying that in, with this sign, you will receive victory. So next morning he gets up, he makes everybody in his you know, army to paint their shields and armor with a cross and they win the final battle. So he says, well, the Christian God has helped me. So let's be nice to the Christians. But his mother, St. Helena, um, became a Christian, Catholic Christian. And she's the one who discovered you know, the true cross of Jesus, you know, the Golgotha, Jesus' tomb, you know, and she's the one who really built many, many churches, right? So what happens to Constantine the Great is that he does not get baptized until his deathbed because he thought that, you know, maybe it was just easier for him to get baptized uh, before dying and get everything forgiven. So he, particularly, I don't think he was really that religious. But he also created a lot of problems because he wanted to control the church. He wanted to, because as, a, as the emperor, he wanted to control the church. So there was a lot of um, power struggle between him and the, the bishops, especially the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, because 
you know, he wanted to, you know, pick his own bishops, like his supporters. You know, he, 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 he was politicizing the church basically. So the Pope had to defend the church from his influence, but it was difficult to do that. And then it goes on to history of the division between the church, between Constantinople and Rome and it's complicated, but we're not gonna go there, okay? Maybe later, I don't know. But uh, for this point, just know that Nero was the one who started the Roman Empire persecution of Christians. Okay, specifically Rome, okay, this time. Tacitus also wrote that some ancient accounts describe the fire as an accident, while others claim that it was a plot of Nero, okay? Pliny the Elder, another historian, and Suetonius and Cassius Dio, all kind of Roman historians, all wrote that Nero was responsible for the fire, okay? Not like Tacitus who kind of gave the possibility, maybe it was an accident, maybe Nero wasn't behind it. These three, actually, historians, Roman historians, actually, no, they said, no, it was Nero. It was Nero. It's Nero who started the fire. And there, these, these are some of the reasons why they say it's because Nero had this envy of King Priam, the king of Troy, and his dislike for the city's ancient construction. Like, what does that mean? Is that, see, King Priam, who was the king of Troy had built a beautiful city, the city of Troy, which of course gets fallen by the Greeks, you know, the story in Iliad, remember the movie, uh, the Troy by um, Brad Pitt, have you seen the movie? So if you see the movie, it's kind of nice, but it kind of gives you some historical background. So King Priam built this beautiful city of Troy and, you know, and, and near his envy because he wanted to build his own city a city named after him, okay? So he didn't like Rome because it was an ancient construction and had nothing about him. So what he wanted to do also was he wanted to build a space to build his golden house called Domus Aria, okay? So he wants to build this huge palace that he that belongs to him and for him. But of course the city is old city, meaning that it's all occupied. So instead of building outside somewhere in, in, in the countryside, it's like, no, I want to build it in Rome. Well, there's no space for it. So there was a huge argument between him and the Senate. So, you know, he wanted to build his Domus Aria, the golden house with lush artificial landscapes and a 30 meter tall statue of Nero himself, the Colossus of Nero. And they say that the total area of this Golden house would be anywhere from 100 to 300 acres, which is about 75 to 226 football fields. Okay, so pretty large area, you know, back in those days, right? So this guy, you know, he, he wanted to build this. So he has no space. Okay, so Suetonius so and Cassius Dio, they're saying that Nero, you know, started the fire. Okay, because he was singing the song Sack of Ilium in a stage costume while the city burned. And Sack of Ilium or Sack of Troy is a poetry about the downfall of Troy. Remember how Achilles and the Greek army built, you know, this huge, you know, wooden horse. This was actually uh, Odyssey's uh, idea, right? Odyssey was the one who, who came up with this idea and the Greek soldiers were hiding inside this wooden horse and everybody was, pretending to leave and the Trojans thought, oh, this is an offering to the gods. So they bring it into the city walls. And then in the nighttime, you know, soldiers come out of the, you know, wooden horse and they open the gates and the Greek army come back in and they destroy and burn everything down, kill everybody, except Paris, of course, escapes and Achilles actually dies, right? But, you know, so he was singing this poetry talking about the sack of Troy while the room was burning. And uh, maybe maybe Re Nero was not in Rome because Tacitus you know, claims that he was actually in Antium, which is about 50 kilometers from Rome, which is Nero's birthplace, which is currently called Anzio, city of Anzio in Italy. And then he returned to Rome after hearing the news. But there is a lot of claim that no, it was Nero who started the fire so that he'll burn down this city so that he could 
build his golden house, okay? So that was the, the accusation. At the end of the day, Nero blamed Christians because to quench the rumor that he started the fire. So there was lots of rumors going on blaming Nero. So Nero blames Christians, okay? He needs to kind of find a scapegoat because why would, why would Christians start the fire? I don't, I don't think Christians would have done that, right? Maybe there's some crazy guy who did it, but anyway, so that's what they're saying in the history okay, about the great fire of Rome. Now, let's talk a little bit about Nero, okay? So Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus, okay? That's the official title. His original name was Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, okay? He is the fifth emperor of Rome. He was adopted by the Roman emperor Claudius at the age of 13 because his mother Agrippina the Younger married Emperor Claudius after the death of her husband. And his mother Agrippina is also, you know, the daughter of an emperor and she's one of the high nobles. So it's all like political marriage and stuff like that, right? So anyway, Nero is proclaimed emperor in 54 AD at the age of 17, okay? And um, of course, in the earlier days, he had many people influencing him with politics, including his mother, but he also had advisors. Um, he was very popular apparently with the lower class Roman citizens because he threw a lot of parties and stuff like that. Like, you know, the Colosseum, you know, gladiator fights and things like that. Have you watched the movie, The Gladiator? you know, with Russell Crowe, it kind of shows you like what kind of stuff was going on in Rome at that time, right? Very, very um, a good uh, projection. Um, his reign is commonly associated with unrestricted tyranny, extravagance, religious persecution, and the debauchery, okay? In 59 AD, encouraged by his mistress Poppea, okay, and she's told Nero, you're mama's boy. So Nero murdered his mom because he was pissed off, I guess. So anyway, and probably because his mom was, you know, influencing to him, getting involved with politics so much. Anyway, so Nero contemplates to kill his mother. So when she was going out into uh, to a boating uh, incident, you know, he builds this boat that would sink, but his mom actually survives it. She swims ashore. And when Nero finds out that his mother has actually survived the, the, the boat, um, he sends assassins after and kills her. Yeah, kills his own mother, okay? Now, many historians say that this is where started Nero's real downfall, okay? Griffin, Miriam, she wrote, Nero lost all sense of right and wrong and listened to flattery with total credulity after Agrippina's death and that Tacitus makes explicit the significance of Agrippina's removal for Nero's conduct. So basically, a lot of historians think after Nero kills his mother, he really went cuckoo, <laughs> if, I could, if I could call that, right? He really went cuckoo. Um, in 60 AD, he began to build a new palace, Domus Transitoria, in 62 AD, Nero's second advisor, Burrus, dies, and his leading advisor, Seneca, a well-known philosopher, is also forced to retire and commit suicide. So there were two advisors um, that really basically ran the empire in Nero's place. That's Burrus and Seneca. But Burrus dies, probably of poisoning. Now, who killed him? I'm not sure. But also his advisor and teacher Seneca, very well-known philosopher, of course, he was forced to retire and commit suicide by Nero. So Nero is losing all these good advisors beside him and he's just doing whatever he wants. So what does he do next? He divorces his wife, Octavia, and banishes her. But because there was a public protest, okay? Because, you know, I guess Octavia was also popular by, uh, you know, um, to, to Roman citizens. So what Nero does is that he accuses Octavia with adultery and then executes her, kills her, okay, his own wife. 
And in AD 64, he publicly marries a freed man. So he, he was once a slave, okay? Freed name man, Pythagoras. I don't think he's the guy who did the Pythagoras the triangle, right? But I think same name, but so he marries this freed man, Pythagoras uh, publicly and Nero takes the role of the bride, okay? And in 65 AD, his mistress, Papea, died. You know, the one who kind of said, you know, Neo, you're a mama's boy. And there's some people who say that, oh, he was miscarriage. But some say actually that it was Nero who kicked her to death. In 67 AD, Nero marries this boy named Sporus because they say that he greatly resembled uh, Popeia, but Nero castrates Sporus, trying to make him into a woman out of him, and they believe that he did this because of the regret for killing Popeia. Very crazy stuff going on, right? And in 68 AD, in March, Gaius Julius Vindex rebels against Nero, and in May, Lucius Virginus Rufus defeats Vendex and the latter commits suicide. So Vendex commits suicide. And Virginius's legions, okay, soldiers, attempts to proclaim their commander as emperor, but Virginius refuses. He doesn't want to go against Nero. But then Servius Sulpicius Galba, who was actually in league with Vindex, he continues to oppose Nero. And he actually gains so much support and popularity and control so Nero is believing that he has lost control of the empire and he's afraid and he plans to commit suicide. But he couldn't do it because I guess he was so afraid to die. He forces his private secretary, Epaphroditus, to kill him. And Nero dies on June 9th, year 68 AD, which is actually the anniversary of his wife Octavia's death. After Nero's death, the Roman Senate declares Nero as a public enemy and Galba as the new emperor. Okay, so that's what happens to Nero. Very crazy stuff. Okay. So let's talk about the persecution of Nero. The first persecution by the Roman Empire. Tacitus writes, to get rid of the report, the rumor that he was the one who started the fire, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians. This is the old way of saying Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procur procurators, Pontius, Pil uh, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Okay, so don't get me wrong, Tacitus was not pro-Christian, like if you just read his writing, like he kind of has a negative, you know, feelings against Christians and you know, Christ, and he calls it basically is all like, you know, some superstition and some, you know, famous, you know, hocus pocus and, you know, so Tacitus was not pro-Christian, but he does say that Nero was the one who blamed Christians for the fire and started the persecution, okay? Another uh, historian, Suetonius, he says, punishment was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new and mischievous superstition. Once again, for Romans, Christianity was mischievous superstition, okay? This is a picture of the Christian martyrs uh, last prayer by Jean-Léon Jerome in 19, 1883. And you can see these Christians here in the background who are crucified and there are some who are being burned on the pillar and there's Christians gathering here and this man is praying and here's a lion and tiger another lion coming out 
okay, to devour the Christians. And all the spectators are watching. You know, this is a gladiator's coliseum, basically. And they're cheering, death to Christians, death to Christians. Because think about it, two thirds of Rome was burned and the mob mentality, yeah, they're the ones who started it, kill them all. Okay, so that's what Nero is doing. He's making this also an entertainment, an entertainment. So watch the movie Gladiator, okay? And you'll see, I mean, there's no Christians dying in, in, in the movie Gladiator, but you can just imagine what it would have been like, okay? Uh, who were first martyrs of the Church of Rome? There's very little information, but Tacitus wrote that many Christians were put to death, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. And he says, covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to the crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired, Nero offered his gardens for a spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and ex exemplary punishment, these arose a feeling of compassion for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. So once again, Tacitus is not necessarily pro-Christian. He's not Christian himself, but he's saying that it was so awful and cruel and, and you know, horrible, horrifying that, that even like people watching it were, were feeling with compassion because this is, this is just too much. This is just too much, right? And we believe, of course, Peter and Paul were probably among the victims, right? So here's a, another famous picture by Nero's Torches by Henrik Siemiradzki, 1878. You see these Romans with slaves and partying, drinking, laughing, and they're watching these pillars in the garden tied up with Christians, and they're setting them on fire to be burned like torches. From Fox's Book of Martyrs, it says that to their names may be added, besides Peter and Paul, Erastus, Chamberlain of Corinth, Aristarchus, the Macedonian, and Trophimus, an Ephesian, converted by St. Paul, and fellow laborer with him, Joseph, commonly called Barsabbas, and Ananias, Bishop of Damascus, each of the 70. So these are a few other names that this Fox's Book of Martyrs mention. Also at Catholic Saints Info, they add these names, although we don't know too many information, Anatolius, Sariaka, Joseph, Parasevi, Photis, Photius, Sebastian, and Victor. Okay. This is just during the time of Neronian, Neronian persecution. So just going back now, like this is the end of our presentation in terms of research material, but I would like to share you kind of my personal um, story and understanding. So first of all, we have to understand that when there is a persecution, especially as extensive and massive like this, it is very difficult to leave records of who died or who didn't die. And it's very hard to know who actually were martyred and were not martyred because just looking at the history of the Korean martyrdom, in, in Korea, there are many martyrdoms, there's several ones, but if you look at most of them, it's, it's very difficult. But, okay, so the martyrdom in South Korea or Korea took place maybe in like, 16th, 17th century. So it, it was it was better recorded, okay? And, and Koreans were known to record things very extensively because um, we have like 
millions of books that were recorded during that, you know, last Chosun dynasty. And Korea is very famous for that. They were very ahead in, in printing machines that actually, you know, scientists discovered that Koreans were the first one to use the, you know, removable um, metal, you know, uh, printing um, before it was in Europe. So Koreans were very well known to, to record things. And also the Koreans also were very um, um, keen on recording family trees. So if you, if you are from this family, like, they have records of your ancestors and it's, it's kind of very Korean thing to do. But what we know, even in Korea, in the later days where there's so many writings and printing presses and all these different things going on, it's very hard to find records of martyrs. And the reason is because, see, when the edict from the emperor or king comes down and says, kill all the Christians, well, most families who are not yet Christians will actually, because they're afraid to be framed as Christians, they will erase the family members' names from their records or from their family tree because they don't want to be persecuted. And all these Christian, Catholic Christians who became Okay, Christians, they are kicked out of their family, the clan, basically. These people still keep their own records of their ancestry, but they're removed from the whole clan. And when persecution has happened, they have to run away from their own homes. And they usually leave almost everything behind and they have to run into the mountains and hide in the valleys and form their own little town to survive. And when that happens, their houses and properties are taken over by other members of the family, other relatives in the clan who are not Christians because it's their wealth, it's the clan's wealth, the family's wealth. And, um, and when these people die, they don't even know who they are and they don't care. They're, they're traitors, they're criminals, they're animals, you know, they, they're treated like bugs. So it's very hard to keep records of who died, who didn't die. So even if that is so hard to do in this time, like, you know, in modern times, you know, in 17th, 18th century, then what would have happened in, in, in the Roman time, right? The first century, second century, um, very hard to record anything. Same thing, there were probably Romans who were Christians who were abandoned by their family and relatives because they did not also want to be labeled as Christians. They were probably erased. They are probably even killed or they were disowned, you know, and, uh, and many, many Christians probably died nameless record this okay so just because some historians say oh well there's no evidence there's no record it didn't happen well no it doesn't matter whether there's a record or evidence or not it happened yes we don't know how many people actually died during Neronian persecution you know we only have records of these few people's names but it doesn't mean that they were the only ones who were martyred. There are tons and tons of Christians who were martyred in Rome. Because just looking at the historical writings, you know, there they were Christians burned on, on pillars as, as, as torches in the nighttime for, for these Romans to enjoy their parties, their garden parties. You know, it's, it's just, doesn't make sense. So please don't worry about what these modern historians talk about, okay? What we know is that St. Peter, St. Paul, and many other Christian martyr saints gave up their lives for their faith, okay? And who started the fire? I don't know, doesn't matter. Because these people were not killed because of the fire, but they were killed because 
they were Christians. That was the only reason why they died, because they were Christians and they were followers of Christ and they did not lose faith, okay? And they kept their faith and they kept their loyalty to our Lord Jesus, okay? So I think that's something that we need to kind of, you know, remember. Why St. Luke didn't write anything about this? Probably Luke was part of the persecution or he was running for persecution. Who knows? It's not easy to write these things while you're running for your life, right? It's not easy to record anything while you're running, you know, to save your lives and lives of others. So maybe that is why maybe there's so much silence about what was going on. Okay, so just the thought, that's just my personal opinion on this, okay? And uh, um, so what happens after math is that once again, from Neronian persecution, other emperors continue to persecute the Christians until the time of Constantine, you know, in the 300, the middle of 300s, so constant persecution. And that is one of the reasons why the Roman church, so the Roman church, so we are Roman Catholics, right? We're not the only Catholics. We're among the Catholic church belonging to Roman tradition. That is why our, our masses and our, our liturgies are shorter and, and they're quicker because the Romans were always under persecution and therefore they didn't have time to sing long hymns and pray long <laughs> prayers, um, just like the Eastern Catholic churches do. Um, so our tradition is because of persecution was formed this way. Um, but we just have to understand that this is our tradition, that we come out of persecution and our traditions was born from martyrdom and the faithfulness of, of Christians the Catholic Christians, you know, in the early days and throughout the history after all the other persecutions and, and, and martyrdom, okay? Um, one more thing that I wanted to kind of uh, pitch in was that um, the church is always full of good and bad Christians. Um, when this was happening, for example, many apothesized, meaning they, they, got, they gave up their faith. Many gave up their lives, but there are many who actually gave up their faith. So it's always like that. And don't get me wrong, it's same now. Like there are good Christians and also there are some bad ones or unfaithful ones, if I could call it. Don't be, don't be scandalized. Uh, the church is full of people who are not as faithful. And, and we even, us who try to be faithful, we make our own mistakes and, and, and sinfulness, right? We commit our own sins. So you know, nobody's perfect, right? But at the same time, please know that because of the faithful Christians, the church will continue on and, and God will use the church as an instrument of salvation uh, in this world. So we, we continue to, to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God and, and uh, all we need to do is try our best to be faithful to Jesus, to be faithful to the teachings of Jesus as best as we can, okay? Yeah, sometimes we make mistakes, but we always come back because so after all these persecutions has been done, many of those Christians who apothesized or who gave up their faith, they wanted to return. And there was a huge argument in the church, like, should we accept them or should we kick them out? Should we never accept, uh, receive them back? Okay, so if we receive them, maybe we have to baptize again. So there was huge discussion, but the Pope at that time with many bishops gathered, okay, and prayed with the lay people and came to conclusion that it was the Holy Spirit's decision that no, there's no second baptism. There's only one baptism. And we will allow these people who abandoned their faith to return when they repent with proper repentance, they can return. They're not forever banned. See, that is the church's decision. And this is what we also need to always remember that when someone that we know is coming back to the faith, coming back to the church, 
with proper disposition and conversion and repentance, then we as Christians need to welcome them with open arms, okay? And, um, and we have to pray for them, okay? Not exclude them or ban them, okay? So we have to remember that this is how our church operates, okay? Thank you for your attention. Uh, I can't believe that uh, we actually um, finished Back to the apostles and uh, looked at some of the, um, um, you know, stories about St. Paul and other surroundings. And uh, I hope you enjoyed, uh, enjoyed it and learned something from it. Well, I have to say I learned a lot about it also uh, while I was preparing uh, these uh, uh, presentations for you. Um, don't get me wrong, like this is... Um, two-way streak, you know, you're not the only ones who, who um, benefit from this, like I benefit tremendously from this, these uh, uh, Bible studies, and uh, I'm also a student, you know, I'm just here to, to share what I learned, you know, so um, let us just thank God and hold the Holy Spirit and our Lord, uh, because they are our primary teachers, they're our true teachers, you know, and we also thank you know, our Mother Mary, all the saints, especially St. Paul, St. Peter, St. Luke, and all these early Christians who were martyred and gave up, gave up their lives to, to show us that, that Jesus' resurrection is real. See, that's the whole point. It's just to show that Jesus' resurrection is real. He was really alive. Why would all these people die if, it, if Jesus' resurrection wasn't real, right? But Jesus' resurrection is real, you know, and... Uh, and Jesus is our Lord and he's our savior. And, uh, and I think we need to really thank God and, and, and thank uh, all the, our early Christians, you know, for, for that, okay? So um, what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. I have to go to my new parish and see what's gonna happen. I can't promise anything, but uh, as you know, I enjoy this as much as you do. So I'm hoping to return my Bible study one day. Maybe you could join me online in the future, but at this time, I do not know. And so for therefore, for now, this is our last class. And, uh, and uh, yes, thank you. And uh, I hope you continue to read the scriptures and study as much as you can. And there's a lot of good resources out there online too. So please uh, utilize that. Go to Formed you know, and, um, and uh, yeah, you know, so don't, don't give up and keep reading the Bible, keep reading the scriptures, don't stop reading it, okay? Anybody with questions about what we talked about today? Anybody? <laughs>